Hello everyone, my name is Anjali Raworth. I am the writer in residence for Book Trust and it gives me great pleasure to be here with you today to mark Earth Day, which is a globally significant day held every single year on April the 22nd to highlight what our climate needs, what our Earth needs in order to us for us to look after it, for us to take responsibility as human beings and ensure that we look after the natural worlds. Now this year's theme for Earth Day is restore our Earths, which means trying to figure out ways we can help heal our Earth and ensure that we take responsibility for any actions we've done to damage it. And I'm so happy today to be here with Tanya Steele, who is the CEO for the World Wildlife Fund for Nature. She is the CEO for the UK branch of WWF and is a phenomenal woman who we're going to get to learn about in the coming few minutes that we have with her. Tanya, thank you so much for joining us. Now you have an incredible background and your path to becoming the person that you are today has been a really interesting one. So just to give you a background on Tanya before we ask her a few questions, um, Tanya joined WWF UK in January 2017 but before that her career really began in the tech industry. She worked as a marketing and communications um, manager and in various senior roles for various multinational organizations and national organizations like BT and Siemens and after volunteering with the Red Cross she then began to take interest in the third sector I'm sure she's always been passionate about the third sector anyway and began works for Save the Children before coming on to become the first female CEO of WWF UK. Now Tanya thank you so very much for being with us here today I'm so honored and so pleased especially as WWF UK was one of the first charities that mobilized me as a child so I'm so excited to hear some of your answers to my questions right Right, so here we go. Right, Tanya, I'm going to rewind the clock right back to um, your childhood. Now, was there a moment or any moments that you recall when you there was something that sparked your interest in the natural humanitarian worlds? Was there particular books or authors or programs that you watched or people that you saw that inspired your love of the natural world? Gosh, when you wind the clock back for me, it's a very long way compared to so many um, of your audience. But I guess growing up, I grew up in the foothills of the Pennines in the UK. So it was quite an outdoors lifestyle. I was always trudging around in a pair of Wellington boots um, and I just love the outdoors. And I guess probably one of the things when I really started to think about nature most of all was finding a frog in my Wellington boot aged about four or five and what marveled it was a little frog it was a baby oh. frog or a froglet I think we would call it um, is how it managed to survive I hadn't been in the water um, most of the day I'd been there in the morning but it obviously clung on and managed to live and survive so I had such an interest in nature like so many people I followed David Attenborough just religiously and loved and learned so much so I've always had that passion I've been very lucky to travel with my um, jobs and roles through the years and I've always been amazed by the sheer diversity that we have on our very precious planet um, and I think that's really what's inspired me and um, to work and, and to do the role that I do today. Well I love that uh, such a small thing as a froglet not even a grown frog inspired you to want to take um you know to take an interest in the world and which you know triggered your, the child within um to become who you are today that's so fantastic um for me I think it was a hamster in my classroom. The hamster in my classroom, I, my, we had a, a pet classroom, class hamster, um, and uh, we took turns to look after it. So everyone had a turn during the whole year to look after it at home. Um, and I just thought it was so phenomenal. This little creature came with just a personality of its own and you know needed so much love and attention, um, but also gave back so much as well. Um, I think that triggered my first kind of really, really young kind of uh, love for nature. <laughs> gorgeous we all used to want to take the hamster home <laughs> yes. you were lucky that was a prize moment for sure absolutely and uh, when we carried that cage home we were the proudest kids walking across that playground for sure um right my second question to you is as the first ever female chief executive of ww FUK since its foundation in 16, 1961, you have already smashed a glass ceiling um, for women and girls dreaming of taking on such roles, not just in, for example, the third sector, but also other sectors as well. So is this the kind of role that you dreamed of um, as a kid growing up or as a teenager growing up? And what advice would you give to young people who are dreaming of landing such a leading role in their cho chosen fields of activism? 
I think um, th there's no way I woke up one morning and thought, gosh, I want to be a CEO. Because I think when you're younger, rightly so, you don't think about that. But what you do think about is the kind of things you'd love to do, the issues that you care about, following your dreams and your passions. And I remember someone saying to me many, many years ago, and I'm sure it's a famous quote probably, but the idea that if you do something that you love, you will never work uh, for a day in your life because it just feels so important to you. And if I'm honest, I'm, I'm really privileged to do the job that I do and I love it so much. I meet so many extraordinary people, but also get to work on some of the issues that I care about. And for me, saving our natural world, preserving our natural world, is critical for all the incredible wildlife that lives there, but also it's important for future generations. Young people, you've got the longest to live on this planet yet. And for me as a mother, but also as a citizen, I just really want to ensure that it's going to be an incredible planet that you can enjoy your futures in as well. Absolutely. And that's what we're all working towards, hopefully, um, no matter our age and no matter where we are in the world. Now, we have just had um, WWF Earth Hour, which is a single hour every 27th of March, where everyone switches everything off um, in their house, whatever they're using, that's electrical. And it happens globally, which is just absolutely beautiful. I love it. Um, ever since I was 17 and the campaign came out, it's been such a huge facet of my world. And 27th of March has been something we've been looking forward to, um, whether it's friends or family. Uh, we can light the candles and sit in peace with without any technological things kind of buzzing away in our ears. Um, what does Earth Day mean for you, this globally significant day? What does it mean for you, um, both as a person and as a, a person who's leading a team trying to help restore our Earth? Well, I think like Earth Hour is that sort of reflection, if you like, and you know, we all sit with candles and talk and it's a lovely moment. Earth Day feels for me is about action. It was first established in the 1960s. And this is a moment at which we do believe that world leaders, we know they're coming together. There's a very big Earth Summit this year, but also business leaders. It's a chance for them to think about what's the action. We can talk about all the things we need to do, but how can we ensure that we stop lots of the destructive practices, but actually put in place things that are gonna help and safeguard our planet for the future. Um, I'm always very struck by um, something called Earth Overshoot Day. And when I was growing up in the 1970s, that shows my age, uh, <laughs> but in the early 1970s, the idea of Earth Overshoot Day is how quickly do we use all the planet's resources up? Um, and it, when I was younger, it was sort of by December. So we were doing it on the basis that the planet could sustain and regenerate everything we've used. Now, that Earth Overshoot Day is usually early August. So we're eating up, if you like, we're using up more of the planet's resources. And that for me is a really important, not just issue, but kind of measure and metric. And it means that we know we've got to start to change how we're living our lives and how we consume these really precious resources that we've got. Absolutely. And we have this massive statistic now hanging over our head telling us we've got eight years to turn this around. The scientists are telling us we've got eight years. Let's use it to the best of our abilities. Now, um, because we're here for Book Trust, um, I'm going to have a book sharing moment with you. Um, so uh, can you tell me about five books that you would recommend that you love um, uh, for children who are really interested and intrigued by whether it's froglets or hamsters or the natural world in its entirety, um, that, you know, books that you'd love to recommend? recommend to them if you show me five I'll show you five so should we do it one at a time so yeah, you go your yes I'm, I might start in age order actually okay so this is a huge household favorite oh, oh yes absolutely. Um, it just tells us so much about nature and about life itself so it's, it's obviously for, for for real top but um I just absolutely love it and uh, it's always we've always kept a copy on the shelf for sentimental value as well Oh, well, that, that was one of the books in um, class where everyone had to go and poke their holes, you know, their fingers through the holes and everything. So it's always a fun book as well. Eric College is absolutely fantastic. And one of my first ones is a, is a kind of new one. It's called Our Little Inventor by Cheryl Ng. And it's just a beautiful story about a gorgeous little character called Nell who has invented something to help save her home in the countryside. But nobody's listening to her. So she makes this epic journey to make sure that she's listened to. Um, and you have to read it to find out if she succeeds. But I absolutely love this gorgeous little character. Um, and she makes me very happy whenever I see her on the bookshelves. Love it. That's a good one. <laughs> What's your second one? So my second one is um, Tidy by Emily Gravitt. And this is a lovely badger. And uh, it's great to observe badgers if you get a chance to see them uh, and their various, um, 
they're very complicated underground worlds, but this badger has decided that he wants to tidy up the forest. Uh, and in tidying up the forest, he goes too far. He becomes really quite, you know, it's beyond tidying up the leaves. He wants to cement it. Uh, and in doing so, he realizes that actually he's lost everything that he loves about the forest. He's also lost his home and his friends. So then him and some friends then go on to take action. But again, I'll let you read to find out what happens in the end. And that's a really intriguing one because it's about balance, isn't it? Not going too far with anything really in life. That's such an interesting one. Um, my second one is Clean Up, <laughs> which is also a new one um, by Nathan Bryan. It's always, it's always illustrated by Adapa Adeola, which is just an absolutely gorgeous book. So rocket in the first book um, uh, when she had look up when she was trying to get to space but in this one um, she takes a holiday goes to her grandparents um, in a beautiful island and goes to find that it's been polluted and she wants to do something about it um, and rocket being rocket does do something about it so you have to read to find out what it is that she does um, but gorgeous character absolutely absolutely scrumptious book all right what's your third one my third one is of course a very famous book the lorax um, and I think this is one to definitely read with the grown-ups too, because I think grown-ups need to understand the story behind this. And it's a big story as well. Of course, it has the Wansler uh, who decides that uh, he's going to make a, a, a very special product called a Thanid, which none of us really, really need. But it <laughs> so really starts to draw uh, down and actually destroy all the truffula trees as well. So it's a really big story. And if ever you wanted a story about our environment and our world, uh, it's definitely uh, this one. It never stops inspiring me for sure. It's a real popular one. Right, so my third, I'm gonna kind of cheat. I'm apologizing to you, Tanya, because it's actually a series. Um, it's a trilogy by Piers Torday. Um, it's the Last Wild trilogy, and it features just this fantastic, beautiful character called Kester, who can talk to the animals. He knows what they're going through. He knows the pain that they feel, um, and the journeys that he undertakes in order to rescue the natural world um, and to ensure that you know other characters take responsibility for what they're doing is absolutely beautiful. Um, so I definitely recommend this, this series if you've not read it. Or already amazing so that was a cheat one i'm sorry <laughs> no, we <laughs> have them in our house so great great books beautiful great. book kester's so intriguing right so fourth one so the fourth one is is a newer one called where the world turns wild it's by uh, nicola penfold and um, feels quite um of its moment actually in terms of really what's happening to humans and um how they've sort of cut themselves off from the natural world but actually they've also been beset by uh, a major illness like a pandemic so it's quite serious it's a very teenage book but it's also an adventure um, so there's an incredible story at the heart of it in terms of our two our hero and our heroine in terms of what they're going to do to really help put the world right as well Oh, that's amazing. Oh, I have not read that one, so I have to read that one. Right, so I'm just going to reach over for my fourth pick, which is Earth Heroes. I think it's a beautiful, almost like mini capsule of activism that's happening around the world. And it features just immense characters that I've never really heard of because they're not featuring you know, prominently, uh, as prominently as, for example, Greta Thunberg and, of course, David Attenborough. Um, you have characters like uh, Bitu Sagnal and Yin Yuzun and Emily Am Am Emily Telford, um, uh, who are who are featured and it's just a beautiful kind of synopsis of what they're doing and a reminder that actually it doesn't matter where you are you can take action to help restore our earth and uh, make sure that uh, our earth is being healed in some way or form so just a fantastic book and it features of course david and you can't go wrong with any book that features david in it <laughs> I will be ordering that one that looks I wasn't aware of it, it looks yeah like it's fairly new I think they've just come out with the the new cover for it so it is beautiful absolutely have a read of it some real inspiring leaders in that book featured so great right yeah, on my list global. final one is Greta of course Greta Thunberg <laughs> and no one is too small to make a difference um it's you know this is a really great book that includes some of her early speeches and her writing is so straightforward and to the point. Um, I think we can all digest it and we can all understand the message at the heart of it. So it's, it's a lovely way to thumbnail your way through just a few of the speeches if you wanted to just learn a little bit more, but also get a sense of perhaps what it might be like to be an activist as well in terms of if you want to speak up and say things too. 
and uh, it will come as no surprise that that is also <laughs> my fifth one as well. Um, so I tend to give these out to schools as well when I'm visiting for talks, um, just because, as you said, she does speak in a very straightforward, um, almost no hassle way. You don't have to figure out what she's trying to say. She just says it, um, which is so wonderful um, and, and uh, just very special. I don't think we have enough of that going on in the world, um, especially when it comes to leadership. So it's just absolutely brilliant, brilliant uh, book, as you say, you can dip into one of her speeches and just go away feeling really revitalized and feeling quite as if, you know, you can join the movement and you can be a part yeah. of this. So yeah. she has that capacity to do it. And I think that's what's captured the world in so many ways. Right, so final question for you. Um, before we leave, um, a BBC Newsround survey taken just last year highlighted that a lot of children are actually suffering from eco-anxiety. Nearly 80% um, are very eco-anxious. Um, and that's a, word, that's a word that's been termed you know, in the modern day age to deal with what children are having to, to listen to and heed and what they're worried about. Um, what three tips can you give them um, this Earth Day to ensure that they feel they are able to contribute to helping restore the earth um, and take care of our natural worlds? What three tips would you give them? OK, so I would say, first and foremost, think about some small steps that you can make. Don't be overwhelmed. You can't and shouldn't think about doing everything, whether it's some recycling, whether it's kind of um, switching one of your meals so it doesn't include perhaps a, a, an animal based protein like the meat in it. So do just a few steps that, you know, actually you feel you can you've got a sense of accomplishment. Um, you could actually just turn over a patch of your garden in terms of just a more weedy patch because, you know, nature does like to revive in that way. The second thing is actually be part of a community. So maybe what can you do with a group of friends or can you ask questions at school that actually might start some activity that hasn't been started yet? Whether I know many schools are amazing in terms of some little veg patches, but actually it could be things around school recycling or where does the school get its energy from and once things can't happen straight away there might be things that the school can do or other parts of your community can do to start to make a much bigger change so it's not all on you but actually it's you and some friends uh, that might want to to, to kind of uh, get that underway i think the third thing is if you're feeling eco-anxious is actually to get out into the outdoors wherever you live whether it's a local park whether it's out in the countryside and appreciate what we do have and nothing revives, I know, me more than actually just sitting quietly for 10, 15 minutes and observing nature, listening to some bird song, or just playing and walking as well. So make sure that you get some time out. Uh, it's important that you don't feel anxious. Oh, that's so beautiful, Tanya. Thank you so very much. And I definitely would take that third point to heart, getting out and reminding ourselves of what we have um, and the things that actually bring us so much joy. And especially in lockdown, we've realised what those things are and how precious they are to us. Um, it's really beautiful. So thank you so much. I hope kids um, and parents and grandparents and teachers um, that that helps you as well to um, lessen your uh, in eco anxiety. Um, Tanya, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'm so excited. I'm kind of blustering my words. But you're doing so much for our planet um, through WWF um, UK and I'm so honoured and privileged that you got to join us and agree to join us um, here at, over at Brook Trust for this talk so thank you so much for sharing your books and your wisdom. Thank you so much and keep writing and reading of course uh, but thank you so much for letting us join you again. Thank you. Bye.